Bobby's Conversational Corner, a podcast on history, culture, and politics in a broad perspective. I am your host, Avi Wolf. You can find this and other episodes like it on Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher, and you can help support the podcast through Patreon. This episode's topic, Giving Dewey His Due. If he is remembered at all, it is as a punchline and a joke. He also ran to Harry Truman and the object of mockery, even from people on his own side. But there is good reason to argue that Thomas Dewey, two-time Republican nominee for president and long-serving governor of the state of New York, deserves our respect more than our derision, as one of a crop of new Republican leaders rebuilding the party and the right generally after the disastrous elections of 1932 and 1936. So who was Thomas Dewey? What did he stand for? How did he achieve what he did, and where did he go wrong? And how did he get along, or not, with the more conservative figures in the GOP, like Senator Robert Taft? Here to help us answer at least some of these questions is political science professor Joshua Kennedy of Georgia Southern University. Josh, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. How did you come to be interested in Thomas Dewey? You know, sort of a roundabout way. Um, A friend of mine recommended a book uh, by a political scientist named Hans Noel called uh, Political Ideologies and Political Parties in America, or it might be the other way around, Political Parties and Political Ideologies in America. I always get it confused. But uh, in essence, the the book was about how major um, intellectual figures, people like Crowley on the left and Buckley on the right, helped to push the parties towards becoming more uh, ideological and ideologically consistent. As a political scientist, I was aware of the fact that in the mid 20th century, uh, my predecessors in the academy were arguing that the parties needed to be more ideologically distinct. And in reading Noel's book, um, it, it really uh, awoken me uh, an interest in how these parties evolved ideologically. And I found myself wondering what was it that bound less conservative and progressive individuals like Theodore Roosevelt, like Thomas Dewey, uh, like William Bora, like Wendell Wilkie later on to the Republican Party with conservatives like the Tafts, uh, Warren Harding and Coolidge. And Dewey attracted my attention as someone because it was unusual that he was a, a two time nominee uh, from the Republican Party who was never elected president. Um, I found his relationship with uh, Richard Nixon to be interesting, and uh, I just decided that I wanted to learn more about this particular individual, and I found a biography by Richard Norton Smith. I believe it's the only modern biography of Thomas Dewey, um, and found him to be a fascinating figure, and in reading more about him, it made me want to learn more about the ideological evolution of particularly the Republican Party, uh, but the both political parties, really, in terms of how they eventually ended up at the point where we find ourselves now. Okay, so let's start at the beginning uh, for our listeners. Who was Thomas Dewey and why did he get into politics, especially as a Republican in the 1930s when the party was about as popular as the Black Plague? Yeah, Dewey was born in Michigan, which was very much a Republican state in those days in the uh, the early 20th century. He was very much a Republican by blood. And going back to political science a little bit, in those days, it was argued less so than it is today, that party was very much a core part of a person's identity. Dewey's father, George, was very heavily involved in politics uh, used to talk politics a lot around the dinner table, um, and and Tom developed an interest in politics at a very young age. He followed, for example, the 1912 presidential election very closely, um, and he just was a Republican by nature. When he moved to New York um, to pursue legal studies and also potentially a career in music, um, he retained that interest in politics and was eager to be a participant. Even in, as you said, a really tough political environment, um, he was out there on the ground. He was talking to people. He was trying to get people to the polls. He was doing everything he could to be a good Republican in what was a very difficult time. And of course, the Republicans were crushed in 1930 and 1932. Um, Dewey 
mentioned it was a disappointing result after Hoover lost the election, but that the winds were sort of against them and that all you could do was was put up a fight. But being a Republican was very much a part of of his character, and it was something that was uh, deep roots in his family. Speaking of character, uh, and this is something that's also come up for me, um, like I mentioned in the introduction, and as we'll no doubt discuss uh, down the line, uh, Dewey, uh, af- at, towards the end of his life and perhaps afterward, uh, was given perhaps an unfair reputation as being kind of wussy, kind of wishy-washy. Uh, Alice Longworth Roosevelt, who herself was quite the character, compared him to the little man on the wedding cake. Um, but the truth is, is that my one of my first introductions to Dewey was not as a governor or as a presidential candidate, but as a prosecuting attorney in the state of New York. He was the guy who basically took down the New York mob, uh, some of the most dangerous, uh, bloodthirsty men in the United States. That does not strike me as a person who is personally a coward or afraid for a fight. So did everybody really buy into this idea that he was a wuss or was it just his political opponents? You know, it's an interesting question. That was the image, I think, that sort of stuck to him. It didn't help that he lost two presidential elections as far as how he was perceived. And you're right, you mentioned Alice Roosevelt Longworth's uh, comparison of him to the little man on the wedding cake, in large part because of his prominent mustache. A number of people actually suggested that he shave it, but his wife very much liked the mustache, so he was uh, not eager to get rid of it. Um, although it did, I mean, as, as shallow as it is, it did play a, a role in some of the campaigning against him. Harry Truman, you know, uh, to be a little uh, uh, snide about it, basically... Uh, compared him to Hitler because of the fact that they both had mustaches. Um, But the reputation as a wuss was very much unearned. Dewey was pragmatic as a political figure. He was uh, a more progressive Republican who was living in, by the 1930s, what became a very progressive era. And he was pragmatic uh, in that respect, but he was not a coward. He certainly, as you mentioned, took on some very dangerous people. Uh, At one point, he was, uh, uh, figures in the underworld were plotting to assassinate him. Um, And he sort of took on this role uh, with relish. He he very much believed in the law. He very much believed in responsible, what he saw as responsible government. And he acquired this reputation a a little bit unfairly as as something of a punchline. I don't think that Uh, necessarily everyone held that view of him. There were people who respected him a great deal in his party, major political figures, presidents like Dwight Eisenhower, like Richard Nixon, who had immense respect for Dewey. But he certainly was not a wuss. To the extent that he developed that reputation, I think it was a function of the fact that he was seen as too pragmatic, too wishy-washy compared to the more conservative members of his party, like Robert Taft and others. I want to... Uh, address that because, uh, as I mentioned, um, after the disasters of 1932 and 1936, which I think is even even worse disaster uh, in his book on uh, 1936, Petruzza mentions that they had even fewer senators left than even the Whigs before they fell apart. Uh, In 1938 and 1940 and years afterward, a group of new leaders uh, starts to emerge in the party who were not tainted by the 1920s or retreats from the Theodore Roosevelt era. One of them is Thomas Dewey, who we're discussing. And the other, as you mentioned, uh, is Senator Robert Alfonso Taft, the son of the uh, uh, Rep- uh, Republican president, uh, William Howard Taft, um, and someone who came to be known as Mr. Republican because he was he basically was almost a one-man think tank uh, and ideological machine writing position papers and crafting legislation and things like that. Uh, but someone who was marked as more, as you said, conservative, although he was not uh, quite the, a libertarian, but he was definitely more conservative. How did uh, both Dewey and Taft fought hard for the presidential nomination and Dewey won it twice and Taft fought hard and but never won the nomination? What exactly uh, was the relationship between the two on a both a personal and political level? Were they always just at odds with each other or were there times when they knew to set aside their differences for the good of the party or the country? 
You know, their their relationship, they were never friends. Um, I think they both respected each other. But Taft, uh, for his part, said that Dewey, he found Dewey to be bossy. Uh, he found Dewey to um, be someone who was a little bit haughty, kind of arrogant, very sure of himself. And Dewey thought of Taft as a little bit too much of a reactionary. Now, they were certainly willing um, to put their own animosities to the side when it came time to to run the race. And so Taft uh, met with Dewey, supported Dewey in both of his presidential runs. Um, and I think that they maintained a healthy level of respect for each other because, as you mentioned, Taft was known as Mr. Republican. He was a very um, apt leader in the Senate. Dewey respected that. Uh, and Dewey was a very uh, accomplished governor uh, in what at that time was the largest state in the union. Being governor of New York was called by some the second biggest job in the United States after being president. And so I think they always respected each other. But Dewey thought that Taft's conservatism was simply not going to uh, win over enough voters to get the Republicans elected president and get them back in the majority in Congress. And to that end, even when he was no longer a candidate himself in 1952, he worked very hard to deny that nomination to Taft. Taft knew that 1952 was essentially his last shot. Dewey was heavily involved in convincing Eisenhower to run for president and in prepping Eisenhower for that run and worked very hard, particularly with the New York delegation, to make sure that they lined up behind Eisenhower. They were both, however, party men, and they were willing to put aside their differences when, as I said, it came time to run the race. They fought hard, but they were invested in each other's success. So you mentioned, and you're probably correct, that uh, Robert Taft's brand of conservatism, which, as I said before, is more complex than most people think, but that's some, something for another time, uh, would probably have not gone over well uh, with the voters, certainly after the Depression. Um, but how did Dewey respond to the charges made at the time that his brand of Republican policy they didn't use the term rhino then, they used what was known as the Me Too charge. Me Too, I also am in favor of welfare. Me Too, I'm also in favor of social programs and federal assistance. How did he respond to the charge that he was basically making the Republican Party into, I guess, just a pale copy of the Democratic Party and not something with its own principled uh, positions or different direction for the country? Yeah, Dewey certainly never saw saw himself that way. He believed that the Democratic Party under Roosevelt and Truman spent wildly with very little attention paid to how that money was being used. He saw the New Deal as corrupt. He saw many of these government programs as as corrupt. And while he did share a lot of he did share some similar goals in terms of providing welfare, in terms of trying to um, uh, guarantee uh, not guarantees too strong a word, but make it, uh, you know, uh, more government involvement in, in, in securing employment for people. He had a different way of sort of going about that than did the Democrats. He did a lot of things as governor in New York while simultaneously, um, cutting taxes and cutting spending. So I, I think the charge of Me Tooism is a little bit unfair, but it's also understandable. At the time, Dewey sort of countered that First, by pointing to the things that I mentioned, that he was very much an advocate of fiscal discipline and restraint, which he did not see the Democrats as. Um, but he also said that he felt he was following in the tradition of Republicans like Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt, who had reputations as progressives. And Dewey said, this is the way in which we sort of maintain capitalism in the United States, is to make sure that people have what they need, their basic necessities that they're taken care of so that we can make as much use of the free enterprise system as possible. He said at one point that there were a lot of individuals in the Republican Party, he said he didn't doubt their character, who very much believed that we should maintain a very hands-off economy, go back to the policies of the 20s. And he said it's fine that they think that, and they ought to run on those ideas, but they shouldn't run on them as Republicans. They should find some other label for themselves. Dewey saw the Republican tradition. He didn't see any sort of um, uh, contradictions uh, 
um, in being a progressive Republican. That was very much the tradition in which he grew up. It was the tradition in which his his father and his grandfather sort of, of uh, lived in. And he saw himself as carrying the torch for progressive Republicanism. And in those days, as you know, the parties were not as ideologically distinct, and there was room for progressivism and conservatism in the Republican Party, just as there was room for progressivism and conservatism in the Democratic Party. They didn't know so much see parties as advancing consistent, coherent ideologies. And so Dewey felt that his tradition of Republicanism was what Republicanism was meant to be in the mold of, of Lincoln and Roosevelt. And that was how he talked about it. Okay. So that's how he defined and explained himself against the more conservative wings uh, of his party. But let's talk about when he, let's talk about his two presidential elections. First, the one that uh, I think that tends to be forgotten and uh, less well known. Dewey, uh, after the sort of uh, dark horse candidate Wendell Wilkie runs and loses in 1940, uh, Thomas Dewey wins the Republican nomination to run against Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the year of 1944, which, to be honest, could possibly have been a worse time to run, because not only are you running against one of the most popular uh, American presidents in, in the country's history, but you're running against him while the war is raging and indeed while America is winning. How exactly do you even start to do that? How do you even try? I mean, he failed, but how do you try to convince not only the party, but the American people um, that it's a smart thing to, 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 to switch uh, when so much is at stake. Dewey argued for his part, and he was correct in this, that the war was, was nearing its end, that, that the tide was turning and that the war would not go on much longer. Um, he essentially made an argument that was common in Republican circles in those days that no man was indispensable. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was viewed by many in the Democratic Party as almost a godlike figure and was referred to by some as the indispensable man. Dewey countered that, said um, uh, that Roosevelt was essentially establishing something like a dictatorship by repeatedly seeking office in 1944, going for a fourth term. Although we know Roosevelt did not live very long into his fourth term, the prospect of someone serving 16 years as president struck a lot of people as uh, excessive, to say the least. Roosevelt, for his part, um, believed that given the conduct of the war, it would be irresponsible to step aside in 1944, especially because he believed that the Republicans would be likelier to win if he was not on the ticket. But Dewey thought a couple of things. Number one, he wanted to establish that the Republican Party was going to be um, uh, not isolationist. Now, I, I think it's unfair to call Robert Taft an isolationist. I think that that's too strong a term. But there were isolationist elements within the Republican Party, and Dewey wanted to push back against those. It was something he had in common with Wendell Wilkie, even though Dewey did not particularly care for Wilkie very much. Um, he did believe that the Republican Party should have a more internationalist bent to it, and he wanted the Republicans to play a major role um, in that in that process. And second, he believed that there was a lot to talk about uh, with respect to domestic issues, and that domestic issues were going to resonate with voters as we were approaching the end of the war. And so his his sort of strategy was to cast the Democrats as sort of sclerotic, as too long in power, um, uh, and the more incendiary tellings of it as um, uh, too close to the communists, too many communist influences in the administration and in the New Deal. Um, so there was some red baiting going on there as well. But Dewey felt that it was a tough task. Um, after the election was over, he did point to the war as what he thought was a major effect for why he lost. Um, but he also argued that, look, we're a free country and we're going to have an election the way we normally have elections and the president should have to defend his record, should have to defend himself. And do we thought he would do a better job than Roosevelt? So he didn't feel that he was doing anything out of the ordinary by engaging in this campaign, but he very much focused on looking forward towards a greater role for America on the world stage, as well as tackling 
what he saw as domestic problems that had not been adequately addressed by Roosevelt's New Deal. Okay. That's a very good explanation. Uh, and uh, I think in that sense, uh, Dewey did a yeoman's service uh, uh, in demonstrating the importance of these American traditions. Let's go to 1948, but back up a little bit. The war is over. Not only is the war over, but all the economic dislocations and dysfunctions of winding down the war have led to so much discontent that the Republican Party has actually won back Congress in 1946, running on a slogan of haven't you had enough with all the labor problems and inflation. The president now is not the seemingly invincible uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but a relatively unknown guy named Harry Truman. Ostensibly, it seems that this is Dewey's moment. He no longer has to worry about the war. Now he can fight, a, now he can fight uh, an electoral contest after he wins the nomination on those domestic issues that you say he cared about. And yet, somewhere along the line, he seems to fumble the ball. How and why? Yeah, I think that there are so many variables there. Dewey felt that in 1944, he'd made a mistake with what was a very blistering speech against Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal um, pretty late in the campaign. And it was well received by many in the Republican ranks, but Dewey came to believe that it had been a miscalculation, that it had made him look too petty, that it had made him look too partisan. And he thought the best thing to do in 1948, because the received wisdom was that Truman was done. He was finished. Dewey thought the best thing to do is to play defense, to sit on the lead and to not make any careless mistakes, which was itself, ironically, a mistake because that allowed Truman to frame the issues much more effectively than Dewey could. Truman went on this whistle stop tour throughout the country, got the nickname, give him hell, Harry. And to borrow a phrase that's common in politics today, he was a fighter. He was very much an energetic presence on the campaign trail. Whereas Dewey dealt mostly in trivialities and made a lot of statements that just didn't seem to carry much meaning. Uh, there was a, a columnist for, I think, the New York Times who who described Dewey's campaign as, as banal, as shallow, um, and as full of such trivial statements as things like, your future lies ahead, agriculture is important, our rivers are full of fish. There was no fight in Dewey because he thought he had the election sewn up, and there was no need to get involved in the in a scrum that could potentially backfire on him. He and some of his advisors did sense that there was some slippage as the campaign was entering its final weeks. And there were those who encouraged Dewey to go out there and be more aggressive. And he thought about it. And there was part of him that favored doing that, but he, he still believed that speech in 1944 was an error. He decided to play it safe, and it did at the end of the day, end up backfiring. Dewey said for his part, the reason that he lost was because they lost the farm vote in those uh, Midwestern and Great Plains states uh, that he had gotten more of in 1944, that for whatever reason, Truman had effectively rallied those voters back to the Democrats and he simply couldn't make up the, make up the ground. I will say I'm not so sure if I, I buy that explanation because Truman also really swept back Congress in that year, but I can understand why he came from that position. So he's lost two presidential elections, but despite that, he's still governor of New York. He's still a major power player uh, in the Republican Party. Um, you And you mentioned that he had a close relationship with uh, Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon, who were very much... Uh, the future of the party, uh, both would be future two-term presidents for the party. Um, could you perhaps elaborate on how the relationship worked? Uh, did they Were they interested in any, any policy or politics advice, or was it just a matter of, we're both in the same party, so we, we, meet, for, we, uh, we meet for drinks and whatnot, but otherwise, please go away. <laughs> 
I think Dewey's influence on both of them was considerable. Um, you know, on policy grounds, Eisenhower and Nixon both had a lot of respect for him. They came from similar sort of wings of the party, as in they were the more moderate Republicans. But Dewey's real benefit to Eisenhower was his political maneuvering. Eisenhower was not a very partisan figure. Even when he came out as a Republican, he was not a particularly partisan figure. Dewey found that appealing in that particular political environment. And I think his value to Eisenhower was very much in his political instincts. More than policy, it was his ability to maneuver. It was his ability to get the pulse of the party, um, to get the pulse of the public that Eisen that Eisenhower found useful. Having said that, they both respected Dewey enough, apparently, to offer him the position of Chief Justice of the United States, which he didn't want because his law firm, uh, once he left the governorship, was a lot more profitable than it was to be Chief Justice of the United States. So I think they respected Dewey's political acumen. They had a lot of uh, policy goals in common, but I think it was more on the political side that they found value in him than it was in the policy side. So I guess I would ask as a final question uh, to this very interesting conversation. Um, what do you think, without making any specific political recommendations or anything like that, in general, what can we learn or what should we learn from this? I guess you would call, you might call it a transitional phase of the Republican Party. People like Thomas Dewey and Robert Taft uh, before we enter the post-World War II era. Uh, for our own time? I think it, it's a question I've pondered a lot, and I'm not sure I have the best answer to it. But what I think out of the gate is that their relationship, the the quarreling, the, the, the back and forth, um, in some sense was I think healthier than what we have today because there's a recognition that parties are coalitions. They're not any one thing. They're made up of lots of different groups who have lots of different objectives. And the main goal should be holding the coalition together. You're not going to get a party that is in line on every single issue. It's impossible in a country of this size and a country that's this diverse to break all issues down into two. And I don't think we ought to try. We have entered an era where people expect Republicans all to hew to one set of views and Democrats all to hew to another set of views. I don't think that that's particularly healthy because I think it's sort of, it's a chicken or egg question, but I think it helps to foment and feed into a, a sort of polarization spiral that I think has been very, very bad for our politics. I think we need a greater recognition in the fact that coalitions are broad and they ought to be broad. There will be quarreling. There will be um, fights. But as Dewey said at the 48 convention, uh, once that's over, you stand shoulder to shoulder and march forward for the good of the country. And I think that that is something that we have lost in sort of the politics of today. For all their, for all their bickering, you know, Dewey respected Taft enough to go visit him in the hospital as he was passing away. He respected him. Um, he he didn't necessarily like him. That's too strong a word. But he recognized that he was an important part of the coalition. These days, there's a lot of focus on purity in the Republican Party. There's a lot of talk of rhino this and rhino that to the point that I think the term has lost a lot of its meaning. But there is benefit in a broad and diverse ideological coalition because you can win a lot more elections that way than you can by insisting on ideological purity. I think that's a very good lesson to learn. And I certainly have learned a lot about uh, a fascinating individual uh, in an important time that is often forgotten. Professor Kennedy, thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. 